who funded the expedition that discovered these fossils. This is a new specimen that came out of Ethiopia of a robust Australopithecine. Uh, this would be Australopithecus boisei. Um, it's called the Konzo specimen. Um, and uh, I've been given the task of doing the reconstruction for it. What you see here in this uh, sort of mustard yellow is uh, the cast part of what was there on the original cranial fragment. And what you see in the orange here is my reconstruction of the missing parts. And we do this and try uh, to get a range of variation as well so that we get an accurate estimation of what the cranial capacity would be, which is very simple to do. You just dump it in water and see how much water this thing displaces, weigh the water, and because it has a specific gravity of one, you've got, you've got it right offhand. The robust Australopithecines died out, as did other species before them. The line of early man continued to develop and evolve. Eventually, humans developed another unique characteristic, speech. One of the world's leading experts in speech of early man is Dr. Jeffrey Laitman. A dramatic change is going to occur after the early period of life sometime within the latter part of the first year and into the second, or maybe a little earlier. What's going to occur is something like this. This is a picture of a young child, somewhere uh, around uh, under a year of age, maybe five or six months, showing again a high voice box. This is what it looks like. This is the tongue. This is a structure called the soft palate dangles down in the back of your mouth if you look in and here's our voice box and this individual will breathe largely through the nose and may be able to breathe and swallow almost at the same time something starts to change what starts to change is that this whole structure will gradually go down in the throat exactly when it starts and the time span that has occurs and how it differs in different peoples on our planet is not fully understood. But we know that this radical change is going to occur. Well, have we gained anything by a larynx going all the way down in the throat? The answer is a resounding, or I should say a resonating yes. By the larynx going down in the throat, we've gained a large space above it that can take the sounds made inside the larynx at those vocal folds and can modify them to a greater extent than that possible for any other mammal. We, in essence, have gone from being a bugle to being a trumpet. We have a lot more tubing. That's what gives us our ability to make all the sounds that are used in human speech. And interestingly, Everybody in the world is the same. Any person can make the sounds of another person's language if they start early enough in life to do that. So we're all one large family with similar positionings of our voice box or larynx. Once we understand how important the location of the larynx is in this story, we turn to another question. What was it like in our early ancestors? Unfortunately, for those of us that work on throats, we don't have fossil throats. The structures that comprise the voice box don't continue into the present. They're not preserved. But we do have some important clues. And those clues come from the fact that the top of this area is the bottom of the skull. And what we've learned is that the shape of the bottom of the skull can give us clues as to where the voice box would have been positioned in our early ancestors. Using the skull of Sterkfontein V, also known as Mrs. Plez, he explains how we can learn about the speech of an ancient hominid. This individual's name is Sterkfontein V for those of us that 
know her personally. It's Mrs. Plez. 